So the session is being successfully recorded. Um, my name is Shana McDonald. I am the Metadata Services Unit Head here at Georgetown University, and I have the pleasure of introducing uh, Terry Reese um, for his webinar today called uh, from MashCat called Evolving Mark Edit. Um, Terry Reese is the creator of Mark Edit, which is, for many of us, we already know, is an incredibly useful tool that I use on an almost daily basis. Um, he is currently at the Ohio State University Libraries as the head of digital, in digital initiatives. Previously, he was at Oregon State, um, which is when he first got started with Mark Edit, if I believe. So he's been working pretty actively in development um, since the late 1990s and um, as we all know we're here really to listen to him give us some ideas about the new stuff that he's doing with Mark with a uh, mark edit um, which frankly I find incredibly fascinating um, and I'm really excited to see it myself so I'm gonna go ahead and turn the presentation over to him um, and he'll share his screen and take it from there Okay, uh, so hopefully everybody can hear me, and let me and share my screen. should now be in charge, Terry. I'll mute myself okay. unless you need me. Okay, so can you see my screen? Woohoo! I see a woman with cat hands. Yes, it's Mabel from uh, Gravity Falls. Okay, I think you're good to go. All right, great. Let me put this down so that it's not... Drink the controls. Okay, so you should just see the slides now. All right, so what I'm going to do is I'll go in and out of the slides eventually when we get to points where we're going to talk about um, uh, examples of some stuff. Uh, so basically, uh, when Galen first uh, approached me with doing um, a webinar uh, for MashCat, it was an interesting proposition. He actually asked me at first uh, to talk a little bit about um, how the kind of uncertainty around the current metadata environments are impacting uh, how I've been developing Mark Edit. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of flux that's happening, a lot of things that are still kind of up in the air, and for trying to develop a tool that does metadata editing, um, there's this idea of being able to, you know, help people with the stuff they're working on now, but also be uh, keeping an eye on what's happening um, in the future and are there ways that you can potentially um, help influence some of those discussions. Uh, so one of the things I'm going to, so what I'm going to talk about um, in um, Evolving Mark Edit is a set of tools that I've been creating around um, leveraging semantic data, uh, specifically being able to start embedding uh, URIs um, into MARC records um, and how to use uh, some of that information to start building other tools um, that actually can help with, with workflows. Um, and I guess I'll say that uh, one of the, the things that um, uh, the, the way that this kind of got developed and, and some, of, some of the ways that this gets developed in Mark Edit when I, when I do some of these things is this was actually based off of um, research that I'd been doing for a while. Um, in Mark Edit, there actually are places deep dark in the application that nobody can ever see. Uh, they're turned off. Um, and they're really there to, um, to support things that I'm working on. And the reason they're not turned on is because um, they're, they're not good. Uh, they, they aren't ready for anybody else to look at. Um, they break too often. And so um, making this available was kind of a commitment to um, uh, try and do something that uh, I could, one, support and evolve as, as it um, uh, moved forward in the future, but also um, to a place for, I figured um, I, was, I was doing research on these things, I figured other people might be um, interested in it as well. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and give you a little bit of background. So as, um, as Luke said, uh, I've been working on this for a really, really long time, longer sometimes than I like to admit. Uh, in fact, if you were to ask me way back in 1999 before I ever became a librarian, in fact was still a student at the University of Oregon, um, I would have told you that uh, I would have never thought this would have been around this long. Um, originally, this was written um, because I worked in the map library at the University of Oregon, and we really weren't supposed to be cataloging. Um, the, uh, the head of the library there was doing um, some on his own and um, had asked if there was ways to work around some of the um, 
some of the, the limitations we had in terms of being able to, to do uh, MARC records. So uh, I started writing it as a way to understand MARC, which is what he was uh, working with, and see if I could circumvent um, the need to use uh, OCLC's passport uh, for Windows. And I guess since this is recorded, I probably shouldn't talk about how easy it was at the time to emulate OCLC's um, connection protocols back then. Uh, much harder now. Uh, the first MARC edit was released back um, September 11, 2000. I did not realize that, actually. I had to go look it up. Um, so uh, thank you, Wayback Machine. Uh, there's the original page there, which I thought was kind of fun. Um, when it was first written, it was definitely looked like a student project, because um, it was really around my interests. Uh, it was uh, written in assembly, uh, the libraries anyway, because that was something that uh, I was uh, trying to um, continue to use uh, early on before I became a, before I went to school, I actually spent a good deal of time um, working, um, writing vertical code uh, for uh, some folks, and uh, we did a lot of um, uh, drivers, so a lot of that work was in assembly. So this was kind of a way to keep those skills. Uh, the interface was in Visual Basic, and the libraries that you could interact with and program to were written in Delphi. Um, today it's all written in C Sharp, uh, at least if you're on Windows and Linux. Uh, that was a change I made, uh, I don't remember, sometime around 2005. It was a choice between doing Java or um, .NET. Uh, I chose .NET partly because most of the users were still Windows-based at the time, uh, so it made a lot of sense. Um, also, there was the Mono project going on, and I was looking for an open source project to participate in, um, and so it made a lot of sense to me then. Uh, it still does now. Um, there's an uh, OS, there's a a, um, a version for um, a Mac that's in active development. It's a commingling of Object C and C Sharp. Uh, it means that the application is a little on the large side. It's about 105, 109 megabytes, something like that. Uh, but that's part of because there's a, a process for fusing together um, what are essentially the um, the parts of the .NET framework that um, are necessary to run the application in addition to uh, the C Sharp code and the, the Object C code. Um, but it seems to be working fairly well and I've been pleased with um, with the feedback I've been getting um, from folks. And from what I can tell, it looks like uh, when updates happen, there's roughly about 200 um, users that are actively using it. There's so we'll see if that uh, continues to increase. Um, people ask me sometimes how many people use Mark Edit. It's hard to know. Um, I have update logs, and from there I can tell there's roughly about 200, about 20,000-ish people um, on an active basis that use the program based on um, how updates happen. Um, if I had to guess at the end of each year, it's probably somewhere closer to somewhere between 40 to 50,000 people that um, download or update the program um, during the year. Um, it's hard to know that exactly with logs, but um, it's, a, it's a fairly large user community. Um, and what I actually am, am most pleased about is that uh, at least a third of them are outside of the United States and Canada. And that, that I think, is a, one of those things that is um, definitely driven um, and shaped the way that I uh, develop the application. If you're new to Mark Edit, this is actually what it used to look like. Um, I actually installed it on a VM, um, so I know it still works. Uh, this is the first public version that was released um, in that September um, 11th, uh, 2000 time. Uh, I always like to uh, let people know that if you if you find that uh, Mark Edit is useful to you, uh, a lot of people thank me. They should actually be thanking Kyle Banerjee and and buying him drinks. He would like that. Uh, he uh, he was the one who actually got me to do this. Um, had he not encouraged me, I probably would have never released it. Uh, same thing is true. If you don't like Mark Edit, blame him and not me. All right. So how did it get started? So these were kind of the initial goals. Um, uh, I'm not a UI designer. This is still true. Um, I hope it's user friendly. Um, whether or not it is, I don't know. Um, it tried to support LC's Mark Breaker, Mark Maker format. I wanted it to be fast. I hope that it is, even though we still add new things to it. Um, I needed to be able to simplify batch editing records for the work I was doing in Oregon State, and I needed a set of programming tools because I very rarely use the actual application interface. So this is what it looks like today. Um, it's going to look slightly different depending on um, your choice of uh, programs that you want running on the, the main program screen. Uh, you get to decide 
Um, there are four, four of those icons you can shift around when you install it. Um, so you get to decide what you want it to look like. Um, and so when I work on MarkEdit now, because I'm not an active cataloger anymore, um, and in fact I do very little work um, with an actual ILS. In fact, my, to be honest, a lot of the work that I do is trying to minimize as much work in the ILS that we actually have to do. Um, and so since there's a little bit of a, a gap now in between the, the work that I do with MarkEdit outside of the research work and kind of the daily uh, workflowy stuff that happens around Mark editing, um, I try and follow a handful of simple rules um, when I'm working with the application and trying to make decisions um, in terms of how I go about doing updates. Uh, I'll also say that there is a, a listserv that uh, when I'm starting to work on something or think that I might have an idea of how to improve the program um, and it's going to make significant changes, I try and toss the ideas through with the community to see if this is actually something that is a problem that people have to deal with. Um, so the three rules that I follow is that one is Mark Edit's a real-world metadata application. I know that a lot of people use it for workflows, and so I can't break those things. Um, anything that adds, it gets added to the program needs to be able to actually solve a real-world need. Um, I even look at the linked data stuff that's being developed now as hopefully solving a real-world need. Maybe not today, but in the future. Um, so that's one of that's the first goal. The other one is it's Mark agnostic. Uh, I like to say MarkEdit doesn't believe in a particular flavor of Mark. Um, and that's actually important when you consider the, the international community that's there. Um, a lot of the tools that are developed are, are very much designed for Mark 21. Um, and, and that has some pluses and minuses. Uh, on the one hand, for a lot of folks, um, if they need a tool that's specific to Mark 21 um, to help them with kind of automatic or, you know, record verification, automatic, uh, you know, uh, correction of data because that it doesn't fit that kind of Mark 21 set of rules. Um, there are tools out there that do that for you um, and uh, do it very well. Uh, MarkEdit was really designed to be that kind of agnostic tool that really doesn't care what data you put into it as long as it's in the, the Mark format, whatever that happens to be for you, it, it doesn't matter. Um, and so that has some, some challenges that go with it. Um, one of them are around character sets. So um, in a Mark 21 world, um, you get to really only worry about Unicode and Mark 8. Um, when you take it outside of that, you have to worry about every, every character set. Um, and you have to worry about how to, map, how to move data between character sets. Um, when you start worrying about XML data, moving data between um, XML and XML that's not in Unicode, which is always surprising me, um, and into the various uh, flavors of, um, of different character sets that um, can be supported in MARC. So uh, I've tried to provide um, a set of tools that um, don't assume that you're coming at a, a set of records using a specific rule set. Um, and like I said, that has, a pro, that has its pros and cons. Um, the other thing that I try and remember is that Mark Edit's not the only tool that people will be using. Um, I look at my work and the work I used to do at Oregon State, it was just one tool that I used in a, in a range of tools when it came to um, working with uh, Mark data and with just library metadata in general. So one of the things that I've tried to make a conscious effort to do is to find places where there are intersection um, with resources like OCLC, uh, with ILSs, with vendors when possible, um, newly with OpenRefine since there are a number of folks who are, are using it, trying to, to simplify the moving of data between applications so that there isn't a, um, so that the, there doesn't become like a, a Mark edit doesn't become a roadblock in that process. At least that's my hope, is that within that larger tooling space that it's easy to move data in and out. If it's possible, I try to accommodate that whenever possible. Um, this is also where um, I get asked occasionally um, if Mark edit can integrate with more ILSs. And I would say yes, certainly. Um, but for a lot of these folks, it's going to require somebody to actually work with me. I find that a lot of the, so Mark edit interacts really well with Koha, at least I hope it does. Galen can probably talk more about that. Um, but that was because Galen had asked, uh, had mentioned that it was something asked in the user community and it was easy to do. Um, I've tried to do it with other um, systems, but ones that are less open that um, protect their APIs, it requires some intervention with people who are actually in those systems. Um, so um, if there's interest, that's something that we would have to talk about. So how does all this relate to um, semantic data? 
and libraries um, when you're thinking about um, um, that kind of development path and what it means and all that blah 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 stuff. Well, when I, I go and I talk to a lot of metadata people and I get asked to do um, uh, workshops specifically on MarkEdit and how people can do um, metadata stuff and people ask me all the time about, you know, um, can MarkEdit do specific things? Well, when I when I think about um, the semantic data and the people I hear talk, they kind of fall into two camps. And, and I hope you like. I, I really thought hard about these pictures, so um, hopefully, uh, hopefully they, they they like them. So, on the one hand, um, what I hear from a lot of folks is when they talk about bib frame and linked data, uh, they fall into this discussion of um, almost a uh, vaporware category. I, I love the Duke Nukem thing because for a really long time I thought of RDA this way and. To some degree, I still do a little bit. Um, you know, for folks who aren't, aren't familiar with it, Duke Nukem was one of these uh, uh, games that was being created that took something like 15 years to make, and when it came out, it was just lousy. Um, it's like the quintessential vaporware. Um, and to some degree, if you think about how long it took RDA to come out, um, there was a lot of folks who, at the end of the time when that was done, um, had that feeling as well, um, although maybe not completely true. Um, linked data is kind of in the same uh, boat. Um, I think that there's a number of um, discussions that uh, I hear that get had that it'll be kind of a genie granting wishes, um, and there's not really a good understanding yet of exactly um, what exactly it's going to do for us practically. Um, and in fact, I think that um, when you talk to folks around these discussions, there tends to be this um, this this general idea of, of what will either of these two things actually do when you think about it in terms of practical terms. Uh, there's a lot of theoretical discussion, and, and and at this point, that tends to be what it is. Um, but one of the things that uh, suffers, especially when you start talking to people who are working with metadata on the ground, um, is is how does this work practically for me, um, and what might this look like for my data right now? Um, and I and I think that's a hard discussion to have because. For example, with BibFrame, I don't honestly believe that what BibFrame looks like now is what it'll look like at the end. I'm not even sure if it'll look close. Um, the linked data one, I think, is a little bit easier of a discussion to have, and hopefully the, the tools that I show you here in a little bit will, will help to provide some of that practical, um, potential practical uh, application. Um, the other one is kind of this idea of, of linked data and BibFrame as data corns. Um, and for these folks, uh, in these discussions, I think what happens is uh, folks actually aren't sure um, what the problems are that these are going to solve um, because things seem to be working okay from their perspective, but it'll solve something, and, and at some point we'll figure that out. Um, and so uh, that's a that's a hard um, discussion to have too, because in that case everything is uh, everything is open for um, discussion, and, and you're not quite sure where the actual um, what actually use cases these particular things are supposed to solve. Um, I'm taking a practical look at this as I go through, and like I said, this is being driven by some of my own research, and I would like to stop and say I am amazed at how many places on Etsy where you can buy cats with hats like this, um, hats for cats like this. I, it was, I was I, I could not believe it. And the other thing I couldn't believe is the number of people that could actually get their cats to put a hat on like that, because I know that um, that would never happen um, in my house. But anyways, um, I think that this is partly uh, jaded a little bit from, from having to work through kind of the RDA adoption. Um, you're looking at a, I, when, when BibFrame was first started to be discussing, when we first started discussing BibFrame, I think there was this, this idea that this was going to be something that would be able to be um, put into production and implemented fairly quickly. Um, but I look at RDA for context. It took something like eight or ten years before the, the specification ever really got there. Um, there was an immense amount of disagreement over whether or not it would actually be worthwhile to do. Um, and while there are very significant changes to the approach that RDA put out there, um, fundamentally, when you look at how it affected most library catalogs and the work that we do practically, there was literally no change. Um, and so that has been an interesting kind of, um, when you look at how we move, when you look at the RDA discussions and put it next to the bib frame discussions, I'm trying to, I definitely take a more practical approach in thinking about how um, we might do this. And so a lot of what I do is thinking about how we might make these um, changes incrementally.
and support folks through that incremental change. And so that's what the Mark Next tool set um, has really been designed to do. It's been designed to help people, uh, help catalogers, particularly catalogers on the ground, um, start to experiment with their data, um, to experiment with um, various protocols that I think will be important um, into the future, um, and to begin to start um, actually getting their hands dirty with some of this stuff. Um, I'm going to talk not specifically about the Sparkle Browser or the JSON or the BibFrame testbed, um, at least not show examples of them. Um, but these are all based off of um, the, the research components that are being, uh, that have been developed into MarkEdit. It's a linked data framework, um, supports specifically JSON, LD, RDF, and Sparkle. Um, the BibFrame testbed uh, stays linked with the Library of Congress's BibFrame um, crosswalking tools. Uh, so users, so librarians at any time can take a set of their files and run them through it um, and see what the output um, will look like using a number of different serializations. Um, and I think that's important. I think that's worthwhile. Um, the JSON viewer is really just so that you can see um, at, a, at an object level what these look like since they're hard to read in the in the BibFrame XML. And then the Sparkle browsers because that's just something I use to, to test uh, Sparkle sites before I um, implement them. The linked identifier tool is actually something though that I think has practical use now um, and is something that's being discussed right now and used um, in a PCC working group that's right now looking at how we make recommendations around building um, URIs into MARC records um, and start to facilitate that transition intermediary space between uh, MARC records solely as um, string data to MARC records as kind of strings plus. So like I said, I'm going to take a look at um, two specific tools. Um, I'm going to look at the links identifier tool, which is for embedding URIs into MARC data. Um, we'll look at how it works, specifically the, that um, uh, kind of the evolution of that resource. Um, and then we'll look at an actual practical application that you can use right now um, that takes advantage of these um, semantic uh, the, the data that's being made available um, by organizations by, with semantic endpoints to start actually building tools around them. So uh, there's a validate headings tool in MarkEdit, um, which allows you to take advantage of the ID.gov um, resources to validate uh, name authority as well as subject authority headings. We'll look at both of those. All right, so the identifiers tool. So this is what the identifiers tool looks like um, in MarkEdit. Uh, this was originally designed um, strictly as a proof of concept because uh, in reality Mark doesn't support the, uh, the, uh, what this tool does. Um, this tool um, was written, um, what, what did I say? Uh, so I had to change that because I had to go back and look. So it was actually 2014 um, is when um, I initially put this together as a proof of concept. Um, it was done uh, essentially having some conversations with the Library of Congress. Uh, I was trying to think of ways, because uh, internally um, uh, in my research, I was actually taking MARC records and converting them um, to a different metadata format and embedding URIs. And I wanted to know if it was possible to start putting URIs into MARC records. Um, we was having some conversations with Zafera folks um, and their, um, their LibHub uh, application and started talking about what, what, would, what it would actually look like if we included URIs into the MARC records so that they didn't have to do that kind of reconciliation once the data came into their system. Um, and in talking to the Library of Congress, uh, we started looking at the subfield zero within the subject and the um, uh, uh, main entry in the subject fields um, and asking them how that data had been used um, in the past. And the nice thing was nobody was using it, um, at least not at the time in 2014. Uh, the, a quick look at the Library of Congress's database had shown that it was only being used in like 100 records. Um, and so it seemed like a great subfield to kind of co-opt for the kind of work that I wanted to do with it. Um, and so at that point, um, decided that uh, I would make that available and anybody who wanted to experiment um, would just have to experiment knowing um, that that subfield may actually change, that had a different use, um, but this was a way to start um, embedding uh, URI data um, into uh, MARC records. Um, the folks that, that uh, were working with the BibFrame crosswalks updated the um, X-Query to support um, 
pulling data if there were URIs in subfield zero so we could start seeing what that actually looked like during a bib frame in, uh, translation. Um, and I believe that uh, Eric and the LibHub folks actually started taking advantage of that data if it was available. Um, so it was actually kind of cool uh, all at once to be able to see um, a number of, uh, of potential uh, use cases come out of that um, by just simply making that data available. Uh, when it first was put together, it was primarily um, targeted specifically towards the Library of Congress, uh, LCSH, and the name authority file. Um, it was working with ID.gov, um, and this was something that I, I have to say that I, I appreciate um, the Library of Congress being willing to experiment, uh, especially after um, uh, some folks at, uh, at George Washington started to use it to um, go through and do reconciliation across their entire database. Um, the Library of Congress traditionally doesn't allow um, the, 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 the amount of record interaction um, that takes place during one of these reconciliation processes. Uh, if you look at a, a single record, um, you know, and you're, you're thinking about how much back and forth has to happen with the Library of Congress's ID.gov service, you're looking at at least probably six uh, transactions going back and forth. And if there's a name that's changed, uh, as a variant, then there's going to be additional back and forth that happens in order to um, validate and change that, that variant. So you have this, this lots of back and forth happening. Um, for a set of 2,000 records, for example, um, you may end up querying uh, them 15 to 20,000 times uh, and over a very short period of time and on a set of resources that really are production but are production in what I would consider a little p. Um, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, so they've been incredibly good um, and, and amazingly willing to put up with um, uh, me um, sending lots of data through their service. Um, and, and that's been nice. Uh, and it's allowed us to learn a lot of interesting things. Uh, currently, um, I've profiled approximately 24 data sources. A good deal of them are LC data sources, but there are also things from the RDA research, the RDA registry. Um, there are things from NLM, um, as well as uh, AAT and uh, ULAN, ULAM, uh, a lot of different resources. Um, translation profiles are in flux. Uh, we're adding more to them um, as the PCC group identifies potential URIs. Um, I have tried to, um, I'm working on a process to allow folks to self-identify uh, URIs. Uh, so essentially you could um, provide an endpoint and then um, in map in place uh, how data gets translated so you would know where the individual uh, either JSON values or, or um, Sparkle values to pull out um, when doing reconciliation. That's still work that's kind of in flux. Um, I'm partly thinking about doing that because one of the goals I've tried to maintain in, in doing data reconciliation is think carefully about the services that we're using um, for reconciliation. Um, some of them that are included like VOF it wouldn't be my first choice, um, partly because the, it's really not designed for what they're, they're looking for, and, and there are a number of other resources that fall into that category. Um, but we're trying to think carefully about what data sources we, we profile, and I, I realize that there are going to be many more, especially local resources, and um, trying to think about how to not make me the, the um, uh, bottleneck uh, in terms of the kind of profiling. So when Market was first designed um, in doing uh, the, the linking tool, um, because it was primarily targeted towards LCSH, um, everything was hard-coded. Uh, as I've been working with the PCC group and thinking about how we make that transition from Mark 21 thinking to more globally Mark as in any format thinking, um, I've been adopting a rules-based file um, that will allow people to actually change the way uh, that mark edit handles identifiers and and which which information gets used when um, uh, doing a reconciliation of a uh, particular resource um, this is complicated some things, um, like it always will. Um, but the nice thing is that when we're finished with this process, what should happen is there should be a very nice set of reconciliation instructions that handle in the Mark 28 or Mark 21 set uh, 
um, both bibliographic and authority files based on kind of these general um, recommendations that um, these groups are coming up with. Um, and then there'll be an opportunity to be able to do that same thing with something like Unimark. Um, so that you would actually have different profiles that you can select to work from. And you can actually change the profiles and create new local profiles that match your particular um, your use case. Uh, let me see if I can show you what the rules file looks like here. I went ahead and pulled it up. So the rules file right now is just an XML file. Um, I'm actually creating a schema for it so it's a little bit easier to read. Um, there are a handful of tags that are created. One is a set of attributes which tells the program whether it's an authority, a bib record, or both. Um, uh, the tags that knows what field it is, the subfields which are um, a set of array codes, indicators whether or not they're necessary in terms of determining whether or not um, you need to look at them in terms of deciding uh, whether or not to look at other subfields. Uh, there are sticky options um, so that you can keep subfields across data elements because there are things that we have to atomize. One of the things that's been interesting is looking at um, sub, looking at, at mark records, mark fields where you have multiple subfield A's and when you start putting URIs into those, if each one of those is an atomic element, you have to break them up so you end up having a lot of repeatable fields. So being able to tell it whether or not you need to do that, whether or not there's special instructions, one of the things that's uh, uh, been incredibly interesting is learning uh, all of the quirkiness of how um, these services um, normalize things for named subjects or generic. Um, and then um, what subfield the URI needs to put in and be put into when it's all said and done because you have potential URIs into subfield zeros in Mark 21, at least that's the way we're looking at it now, but in Unimark it may be a different field. And in fact in Mark 21 we are looking at URIs in other subfields. So um, this idea that you have the ability to um, be flexible and how that gets output. And this rules file then gets reused um, in other tools. So in the link data, in the validate headings tool, this rules file gets utilized rather than hard-coded data, which has the um, benefit of eventually being able to shift validating of headings, which right now is a very LC-based thing, um, into a validating of headings of anything that's been um, uh, profiled within the set of rules files. And so all this is based around this concept of changing mark records from looking like this, where you have things that are very string-based, even the 600 field where OCLC right now is adding subfield zeros with these kind of control numbers, which, um, you know, that's, that's how mark, tell, mark 21 tells you to do it. Um, but from my perspective, it makes no sense, um, especially if I'm giving this data to somebody outside of the library. I want to remove as much domain-specific knowledge as possible um, into something that looks more like this, where you still have the strings um, in the marked data, uh, but the um, identifiers uh, allow, in hope, um, systems that uh, can accept this data uh, to actually keep those strings updated for you and, and make editing easier for you and lots of other things that go with that. Um, and so it's a process. The, the, the move to um, something like BibFrame, I think, um, the actual moving it into the, the BibFrame part once we actually know what that structure looks like is actually the easy part. It's the reconciliation part here that becomes the hard part. And it is the hard part. Um, let me show you here really quickly what this looks like uh, so we can see. Um, so in Mark Edit, um, we have uh, the link data tool here um, under Mark Next, uh, link data. Uh, if you highlight um, the little um, icons here, you can see what are the items that are being automatically detected. So these are the um, current vocabularies that are being looked at. Um, and then the three uh, XX fields, these are primarily for RDA vocabularies, um, so we can check these things. You can embed work IDs. You can add a VOF. It's something that I've separated out partially because, um, again, um, I'm not, in the long run, I have a feeling that uh, there will be much better options from OCLC around um, linking to OCLC data, uh, so I'm not a big fan of linking to VOF. So once you're done, you basically just run it. And the tool goes out then, and it starts talking to lots and lots and lots of services. And I don't think I'm going to actually wait for it to finish because it's a small set of 
data that's being looked at, but it's um, it looks at a lot of different sets, and I can't remember what all is being looked at. So I'll come back to it in a second. So that's how it works, and you can actually embed this process. I'll open this up here separately um, in the Mark Editor. So one of the things that um, because this tool is being used um, in real world work, um, it's accessible from um, the Mark Editor, where you actually probably do most of the the real editing work. But you can also assign it um, as these um, as a tab. So that kind of um, automated processing. It's one of the options uh, in the task, so you can actually make it a part of your workflow where you can actually, at this point now, um, if you wanted to um, live dangerously and put your mark, put those URIs um, in your, your data, um, you can actually do that uh, right at this moment. And my guess is probably doing live stuff over um, this kind of feed is going to be tricky. All right, so linked data tools. So things that are still hard. Um, one of the things that's been really interesting working through this um, and working through the individual data providers um, is that um, as I've been going through this, I found that most places use their own rules for data escaping, um, and they're not documented very well. Uh, it's kind of like the difference between using um, the, the URL encode and the encode functions in PHP if you're a PHP person. They kind of do the same thing, but not really. And you run into that um, in a lot of these linked data tools where you would think that if you used a standard base of encoding, it would work, but sometimes data needs to be literals for those systems to work. Um, the other thing you find is that they're not really well suited for a lot of this kind of reclamation work. Um, there are tools specifically like um, AAT and ULAN and, and VOF where the resources were designed, they're Sparkle, either Sparkle or Open Search APIs, um, but what happens is they're more what you would consider search browse. The tools want to give you back a response. And so if I search for something that's generic, so let's say like networking, even though I don't know if that's really a term, um, and there are lots of data elements like networking for kids, networking for adults, networking, you'll get that long list. And what you really need for this kind of work is you really need something that gives you the ability to ask for exact matches because otherwise you end up having um, a very fragile based system doing this reclamation um, and you end up getting not all, well from my perspective, you don't have a lot of confidence that in resources like these that you're getting the match that you want because there's so much processing that has to happen on the other side to make sure that you're sorting through that list and actually matching the search terms. Um, the other thing you find out is a lot of things are little peas. Um, lots of lookups can take these systems down. Uh, and in fact, one of the things that we've learned over the course of the year working with the Library of Congress is that um, I've had to make changes in the ways that I approach um, searching their resource uh, to try and minimize as much as we can in terms of the interaction between the two systems. Um, likewise, they've been able to make changes on their end, specifically in terms of embedding data just in the header, um, allowing me to make calls because I don't actually need all their metadata to get that first response and then if I need more information I can go down further. Um, I think that that kind of interaction that happens between um, tool builders, especially for something like MarketEdit that potentially is doing large reclamations and the data providers has to happen. And, and it's something that I, I actually have tried to do, especially through the, when we're doing PCC, uh, discussions is reach out to individual data providers before I turn them on because I know that once they're there um, I could potentially be sending a lot of data their way um, and they may not be prepared for that kind of interaction. I know some places would like to think that everybody will just download their really large set of, of linked data and use it locally um, but in a client application like MarkEdit um, a quick you know look at the say 24 resources that I've, I've profiled would be asking people to download uh, something in the neighborhood of like 50 gigabytes of data every month. I mean, it's just unrealistic. Uh, the other tool, and this is one that's, uh, that actually is we're using, um, uh, experimenting with using here at, or at Ohio State University um, to see if we can um, adjust the way that we do our authorities headings, authority work is, is a validating headings tool. So while the linked data tool um, is very much kind of this proof of concept of uh, how you would embed um, 
URLs and URIs into a, uh, a MARC record, the Validate Headings tool is actually a real-world world tool that you can use now to actually check and see is the data that is in my the data that's in my MARC record is it actually defined in the LCSH or um, or in a uh, national or name authority file, um, and if it's not, can I create a brief record um, right now? Uh, can I correct variants on the fly? Um, can I just export out that set that has those problem records so I don't know I only have to deal with these and then um, so if I'm sending data to backstage I'm only sending a handful of records rather than the 10 or 15,000 that I'm working with right now. Um, so let me go ahead and show you what this looks like really quick. Um, the validate headings tool lives, no oh, good it actually finished. Uh, so uh, let me pop this open real quick. So here's the, the tool that was linked. We ran it against it. The linked records, you can see that uh, this is from a data set that we're using on the PCC. Um, data elements are being linked um, as they're being found, and that includes the 3xx fields, which we asked it to do, as well as the um, 650 fields and the 700 fields when they're there. Um, in addition to embedding an OCLC work ID, um, I have a feeling that this mark field is probably going to be one that has to change. Uh, I will admit that when I picked this one, it was um, because it was just a, it was just uh, convenient. Um, so anyway, so you can see that the linking the linking works. So if I'm using this for real world work um, and I want to validate headings, um, I can open a record here. Um, in the MARC editor and then I can go to these reports and validate headings. And this is where I get the opportunity to, and I can do this outside of the program, this is a standalone you can get from the main window, but from within the MARC, validate, MARC editor, I can tell it to create, generate brief uh, personal name authorities if they're missing in my file, I'm not going to. Um, I can authorize the entire 6xx field or I can authorize just against the subfield A. Um, there are reasons you might want to do both. Um, you can have it automatically correct variants as it's working through them. You can have it at the point of validation where it's doing um, the, the validating to actually embed URIs when they're there. And this is actually one of the ways where if you have a URI in the record, the validate headings tool actually use it. It doesn't have to look you up anymore. It can actually use the URI to go check and see is the string in your record match the data that's at the URI point. And if they don't, then it will fix it. So that's actually kind of nice because once your data has URIs in it, tools like this one um, can actually take advantage of that data uh, to keep your data in sync. And I think that's kind of the proof of concept of what I hope eventually our ILS systems will do. Um, there's also a local cache. Um, so as MarkEdit is capturing this data, it keeps the data in cache for about 30 days. Uh, you can delete it, so just by checking it, delete it. And then we can go ahead and process the data. And I only put five records here. Um, so this is just interacting with the Library of Congress. You can see here um, how long it takes to complete the record, the amount of the average response time. I put that there partly because um, you will find that there are peak times where it takes a really long time to run this, and we found it um, experimenting a little bit um, uh, here at Ohio State. Some of our large record sets take a very long time to process, so it's just good to run them off hours. Um, so anyway, so this is five records. Um, said that one had an invalid heading. Um, tells me what that heading is. Uh, tells me how many items were actually queued. So it, it looked for 14. Um, and it tells me if there were variants found um, and uh, what other headings were found. And so from here, I can copy this report. Um, I can close this and then I can extract that one record by clicking on the extract and pulling that record out so that I can either send it to somewhere else or handle it locally internally um, or I can uh, save that report that you've seen as a delimited file so that I can look at it and work with it later. So you have a lot of different options in terms of being able to work with your resources once the headings have been validated. Uh, right now um, this tool is, is going through um, uh, a set of transitions. So just like the linked data tool was completely hard-coded um, originally um, and now is controlled by a rules file, 
this tool here as well is moving from um, hard-coded strictly to the Library of Congress's resources to um, being able to take advantage of the rules file. And the, what that's going to do is that's going to allow us to look at data um, that's in, say, like the 600, the 700, or even um, in other fields uh, that, are tar that are tagged with a subfield 2 and identify um, a different vocabulary. Uh, so we can actually do validation of headings, and I guess maybe it's not even at this point, at that point it's not a validation of headings, it's more of a, a validation of strings or of concepts uh, where you can actually validate data against a wide range of resources and specifically things like here in the 3xx fields um, using that data and potentially embedding URIs so that as these, if any of these text strings change, um, again, like the, the automatic validation of headings that can update variants and update changes, you can embed that directly into um, just the general processing of records uh, as you go through that validation report. Um, so this is a, a proof of concept of something that's been built on top of um, that mark edit uh, link data framework that's been created in the application. So while that, like I said, is that while that framework was initially designed specifically to facilitate research and to, to look at, you know, kind of experimentation with BibFrame and linked data stuff, we're actually able to start now looking at, uh, because we have these semantic web sources out there and, and these endpoints, we can start saying, okay, um, we don't know really uh, what the future is going to look like. This is still something that's being discussed and written, but we can start using the data that's made available to us and start taking advantage of it. And that's kind of what the concept around the Validate Headings tool and some of the other things that I'm, I'm trying to think about now in terms of how to start taking advantage of these data sources um, to make it easier for folks to do um, validation of headings or batch um, global editing. Um, those kind of things to start allowing a little bit more automation um, because we have these data sources with the caveat of folks knowing that anytime you touch one of these data sources, you are doing a lot of external um, uh, data lookups and um, there is a, a time penalty obviously that, that is taken into that account. All right, so here's the validation tool, standalone tool, showed you an example. All right, so what am I doing still um, in terms of, of working with MarkEdit and trying to continue to profile it? So um, I'm looking specifically at how we add more vocabularies and also trying to work with the ones that we have to see if we can't make them more friendly for the kind of work that we need to do now and into the future, particularly around reconciliation. We have so much legacy data. Um, there's going to have to be a process for um, helping people move from legacy to um, something that's kind of that strings plus. Uh, and some of that then is thankfully working with the, the other members of this um, PCC group, talking to um, people who are providing uh, endpoints now um, and asking them to think carefully about if they, one, are even interested in supporting that kind of reconciliation um, as a kind of infrastructure component. And if they do, uh, providing a service that really actually provides something that is more of an exact match. Um, and even thinking about how we do this in a way um, that is as lightweight on both services as possible, both uh, from the user who's generating and asking for this data, but also the service on the other end. Um, Trying to expand, um, like I said, the headings validation to more than just uh, LCSH and NAF. Um, I think that that's something that uh, will happen uh, much sooner than later. Um, and I'm hoping uh, that working with a handful of folks that are outside of the United States that um, particularly are interested in that work um, will help to make that a, a much stronger uh, process. Um, definitely looking at how to provide uh, linking profiles for Unimark considering how, um, how well used it is um, outside of the United States, or at least that it's used outside of the United States in fairly large numbers, um, but also providing some, some better um, documentation on how to create your own um, linking profile. Uh, that way, if you're using a flavor of Mark, say, for example, like Finmark or one of these flavors that um, are used as a, in a national flavor of Mark, uh, 
uh, that there's uh, the ability to be able to look at the existing profiles and make changes for them, make changes to them um, so that they work uh, there. And then the other one is starting to look at um, how to start making use of kind of these same as um, uh, tools. Um, specifically, I'm thinking of, of some of the work OCLC has been doing with their uh, people um, service. Uh, this idea of being able to start uh, taking information that we know is valid, say for example in LCSH, but then being able to take advantage of knowing that that's the same as all of these other vocabularies um, and how do we link those together because I think that's really interesting um, and I'm not quite sure yet what that'll look like, um, but um, really interested in how that might work specifically in a discovery context where you have large international communities and can you bridge that gap between all of metadata which tends to be very anglicized and English based to something that can make that crosswalk just using URIs without having to actually do a lot of actual data embedding into the resources. I'm not sure but it's something that I'd like to experiment a little more with. So that's kind of what I got. Um, uh, I think we've got a few bit, it looks like we've got about nine minutes to ask questions. Um, and I think I can see them if I um, change my thing here. So like this. Well, I can, um, I can read them off as well. So, oh, okay. um, so May, was, uh, May Chan asked, so I was wondering why the URI is added at the bib level instead of relying on a URI added in the authority record. So uh, we actually are looking at them in both. Uh, so URIs and the bibliographic record would make sense um, specifically, well at least they would make sense in, right now if you were linking specifically to um, uh, all of those uh, stringy based things like I, I would think in the 6xx and in the 1xx in the authority fields we're actually not linking the 1xx field because it would be self-referential but actually building links to other things that are in them. Um, but I think it's still, um, I think part of the reason why we're, we're looking at where you can put URIs is that nobody really knows quite yet how they're going to be useful. Um, and within the bib frame context that we have now, um, if you look at how the X query um, transformations work, uh, they specifically look for um, those subfield zeros, um, so URI linking to build those relationships um, both within the bib and the authority record. So it's really kind of, I think, hedging our, I think at this point it's just making sure it's, it's wherever it, it potentially could be. Other questions? We have plenty of time. Um, we can go over a little bit if needed, so please don't hesitate. So this all made perfect sense to everyone? I admit I have to actually go kind of play with it a little bit more, and I've been playing with it through the PCC group. Um, and there's portions of it that still is a little are a little fuzzy, but I think that's kind of the nature of the beast right now. Everything's a little fuzzy when it comes to linked data and bib frame. Um, having to get really comfortable with not knowing things anymore. So plenty of time. Yeah. Well, and I, I think that's that's what I'm hoping. So one of the reasons for starting to make some of what I what used to be kind of my private research. You know, some of the pieces that have been privately set aside for research has been mostly to um, uh, give catalogers who have been asking for a while, you know, what can I look at, what can I do now, um, and are really interested in, in being able to engage in, say, like the bib frame discussion. But a lot of the, a lot of the stuff that's being done right now, um, from my opinion, that's uh, on the bib frame list and the tools that are being created aren't really targeted towards catalogers. It makes it really difficult, I think, for folks on the ground who might be really interested in participating to be able to participate. Um, and I'm hoping that some of these help to um, lower those barriers, if you're interested. It's also something that could potentially be used, um, as you said, a proof of concept in terms of talking with administrators. So, yeah. uh, Mary Acock asks, is it premature to add URIs to BIP records? In other words, should we wait for the discussion papers to come out at ALA Annual? I don't know if people saw the chat earlier, but the uh, MARC Advisory Committee, which reviews and um, 
and updates Mark since Mark is, well, as someone put it once, is a zombie. It's not quite dead, but it's not really alive yet anymore, but we do have to keep it moving. Um, we're expecting some discussion papers and some proposals from that URI group and related to which subfield and recommendations, um, which subfield for the URI and additional recommendations. And Terry, I think you're right. It's going to have to move out of that 787 field um, because of the other way that that field is used um, yeah. for serials and linking fields. Um, yep. So... Um, but I, but I think if you're looking at um, whether or not you want to start adding URIs to subjects or to, you know, your to the one xx, three xx, six xx fields, seven xx fields, um, it's really up to the local institution how comfortable they are um, with doing that. Uh, I know that um, George Washington, Jackie Shea, who's on the PCC group, um, they've. I know they're actively doing it um, because it's something that they found interesting to experiment with. And I think that's kind of how you have to look at it right now as it is kind of an experiment. And I do think actually in terms of using the subfield zero, the PCC group has an international team of advisors as well as members of the task group that are also international. And the subfield zero at this point seems to be something that most groups have relatively agreed upon. Um, and it would also be something, if you were consistent in how you put it in your record, that it wouldn't be difficult for you to actually do a batch um, action in order to move that to another subfield if necessary. Um, yeah. So there is that. It's more if, if adding URIs to bib records, just make sure you're consistent in how you do it. Um, additional questions? Um, so Kelly McGrath would like to know, do you have any thoughts on how this incremental transition will play out um, and what do you think will be the optimal scenario of that in terms of transitioning? Um, because it will be a big challenge to the library community. Yes, it will be. Um, I don't know, actually. Um, I think one of the, the one of the challenges that we have as a community, obviously, is that so much of what we do is tied around our, our vendor space, um, for better or worse. Uh, and, and when I read every time, uh, you read about every vendor who is investing in BibFrame. And when I see that, it makes me laugh a little bit because I don't actually think that that's, um, I, I don't exactly know what they mean when they say that because I'm not sure they exactly have a good concept of what that means either. Um, it's it's a set of words we use at this point. Um, but there has to be, there obviously has to be some kind of change. Um, what I think is actually probably most uh, likely to happen is that when we do finally shift over to BibFrame, nobody will notice, um, at least if you're a cataloger, because you probably shouldn't. Uh, the tools should actually hide most of what you're doing there. Um, what actually will be the more uh, disruptive change is going to be um, this kind of, I think it's going to be more of the this kind of work where we have to start having um, more well-defined trust relationships over um, who we consider to be our um, uh, authorities because to be honest, I think that's that has been um, one of the more interesting discussions that I've seen uh, in the work that um, uh, UC Davis and their um, OLA implementation trying to um, come to a uh, uh, figuring out how do you um, bring together local authority headings that are created before the national heading and, and then ones that you want to actually have that are um, better than what would be in a national authority heading. Um, so I think that that's probably where, at least initially, most of our um, challenges are going to come with is that that kind of incremental change of, of moving to working in a data space where everything isn't just kind of local strings that we, we do our own thing with. We've, we will become much more interdependent on each other um, in a way that's very different from, say, like WorldCat or something where you can take it or leave it. It'll also be interdependent beyond the library community. Um, you hope so. We really um, hope so, I'm, yes. That's the ultimately... I, I'm not sure that that's <laughs> true uh, because we, we don't have a good track record of that, but I no. hope so. But we're, we're, that is the ideal, is that, that we would not be so siloed, um, at least in terms of our main access points. Um, so we shall see. It's, it's, going to, it's a very exciting time to be involved in this aspect of libraries. 
Yeah, I think so. I think that this is all really, really interesting. Um, I, it's hard sometimes to to get a little depressed to, to you know figure out you know that really interesting work versus the how long is it probably going to take to to get that into a space where it's actually being used. But um, hopefully it'll be sooner than I think it will be. But um, uh, it is really interesting. So we probably have time for one more question. Anyone else? Okay. Well, Terry is going to go ahead and turn the presentation back over to me so I can stop the recording. Um, but I would like to thank everyone for attending um, and for your questions. This will eventually be posted on the mashcat.info page um, so that you will be able to um, watch this again. I know that there's there were plenty of things that um, I would want to go back and refer to. I do that kind of stuff all the time. So. Um, Terry, thank you very much for your time. You really appreciate it. And thank you all for attending. Talk to you soon. Thank you.